Amen. Praise the Lord. Sure is good to be back in the house of God again. In just a moment, we're going to sing page 577, which is, Brethren, we have met to worship. And that's what we've met to do this evening is worship. And we want to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. And I trust that's what you would like to do as well. Those of you that are listening by way of live stream and viewing by way of live stream, we'll sing this song together in a moment. We'll go to the Lord in prayer and ask him to meet with us tonight and to meet the needs of his people. Ask him to touch our, our, our nation, to touch our state, to be with our people, that God keep us and watch over and protect us and put a hedge of protection about us. Amen. I believe the Lord can do that and will do that and has done that. And I thank God for that. And it sure is a blessing. But let's go to the Lord in prayer. Then we'll sing 577. Brethren, we have met to worship. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, as we approach the throne of grace, thank you so much, Lord, for your mercy. God, thank you for your grace. Thank you, Lord, for extending it down unto me again today, how you have on a daily basis, how you do on minute by minute, second by second, God. Now, your blessings are poured out upon me, and I thank you for that. God, it's such an encouragement, Lord, uh, to be able to look to heaven and know that I have someone that loves me, know that I have someone that cares for me, know that I have someone that is looking out for my best interest, Lord, and I thank you for that. I pray tonight, God, that you'd touch. I pray, God, that you'd bless. I pray you'd help us meet with us, O oh Lord. We want to hear from you, God. We want to hear from heaven. We want to see what the Word of God has in store for us this evening. And I pray, Father in heaven, Lord, that you would touch the Word of God as it goes forth tonight. I pray that you'd touch my old lips of clay and let them speak, Lord, what thy will would be and what you'd have them to say. I pray, God, as we get ready to sing, we lift up our hearts and our voices in song unto you. And, Lord, we have met the worship. That's what we want to do. We have those meeting with us online, some even around the world. I pray, God, we'd meet to worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, help us to put aside the things that have went on today. Help us to put out everything that's blocked and hardened our minds and hearts. Help us to get rid of all of that, God, and just to look to you solely for everything that we need. And I'll give you the honor and the glory for all that you do, all that you've done. For it's in the Lord Jesus Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Let's stand. We'll sing page 577. Brethren, we have met to worship.
was speaking to someone by way of phone earlier and have talked to several pastor friends of mine in the last uh, few weeks, several weeks, and I uh, talk to them quite often anyways, but just with things going on the way they are, we've talked even more so, and I was able to see a couple of them uh, and be around some preacher friends of mine uh, yesterday and be in the presence of them and talk with them about a few things. And, you know, I spoke with somebody on the phone today, and I, I said, with everything that's happened, with everything that's going on, um, we make the statement, you know, I can't wait till things get back to normal, things get back to the way they uh, once were. But I'll say this, I don't want to come out of this and things go back to the way they once were when it comes to the Christian life. Amen. When we come out of this, it ought to people, people ought to have a holy heartburn Amen. for the God of glory. Amen. They ought to realize what they've missed and what they hadn't necessarily Amen. been able to do. And sometimes, if you just be honest, we take things for granted. We take things and just think, well, that, that's going to be there. There's some that would be like, well, the church is just going to be over. We'll just, we'll just go when we want to, go when we feel like it, go when we can. And then some people at that point when things are like this and it's like, well, you can't really uh, go because there's going to be this amount of people or this is going on, that's going on. Then you got those that think, well, I'll go when I want to or how I want to. But let me explain some things. This is a privilege, amen. Meeting with God in God's house with God's people as God in heaven died. So we could do this, so we could congregate together. <laughs> hey, it blesses my soul being able to get together. And I think about how I was listening to a, a thing the other day that Brother Sexton put out. I believe I mentioned I'd have my wife try to share that. And I don't know if she can even share that anymore because I believe it got took down. I won't mention about that. And I have plenty to say about that, and just not now. But the fact is, he was mentioning about that Hebrides revival in the early 1900s. Those two older ladies that prayed, wanted revival, had a heart for God. And just couldn't get to the church house. One had spinal stenosis. She couldn't go. She couldn't go to the church house. So they made their house a house of prayer. Now God says my house shall be called a house of prayer. That's what we should be doing. We should be seeking the face of God. And we ought to have some people have a heart for God. A hunger for God. The apathy that's in today's day. In today's society. And the people that you would think man surely these people will have a heart for God. Surely these people want what God wants. And it's just like well that's just everyday life for them. It's okay. It should not be that it's normal just to come to the house of God and go home and everything just be fine. We ought to want to get a hold of God when we come to the house of God. We ought to want God to move in our lives when we're not at the house of God. We ought to want God to move. We ought to want people to know that we know God. That God in heaven has stuck a fire in our soul and that we want people to realize that God in heaven is still on the throne and that Jesus still saves sinners and he can still do that today. Amen. And then they come down to the place where they want to call the preacher and make sure he's thoroughly right with God. There's one of the problems that's in today's day. We got preachers get behind a pulpit that couldn't tell you if God's around or not. Because they ain't right with God. They got sin in their life. They've got things going on in their life. So they don't they couldn't tell you if it's just business as usual or if the Holy Ghost showed up. That's a bad thing. That's a that's a sad thing. Not just a bad thing, but a sad thing. We need to get to the place where our hearts pan after God. Where what we want is the Lord. Where what we want is Christ Jesus. Where what we want is him to do a work in us that people would see that it's evident that we know Jesus Christ. That people would see that there are still holy people that love the Lord. There are still people out there that their hearts still crave what Jesus would have for them. That they've not went the way of the world. That they've not fell into everything. Well, this is just the way society's going, so we'll settle with it. That we've not settled, but praise God that we've looked up and we realize that Christ is still on the throne. That Christ still wants to fill us and Christ still wants us to serve him because we love him. That's the fact of the matter is we should serve him because we love him. We don't serve him just because, well, this is something I have to do. No, praise God, it's something you get to do. And that's a blessing this evening that you get to serve the living God of glory because he's on the throne and he's in your heart. And it's a wonderful thing to know that I know the Lord Jesus Christ. But praise God, it's a wonderful thing to know that he knows me. He knows my name. He knows where I've been. He knows where my house is at, where I pillow my head. He knows when I get up in the morning, when I rise, and when I go down, I lay my head. He knows every bit of that. He knows my going on. He knows what's going on in my day, where I'm at, where I'm going, when I'm coming in. He's got all that. He's not took by surprise if a tire blows out. He's not took by surprise if I got a belly ache. He's not took by surprise. And no matter what happens, God knows, and that ought to excite us this evening, that he pays that much attention 
attention uh, to us and he loves us so much that he's going to pay that close attention. Thought about it today as I talked to an individual on the phone and speaking to him about the children, about my children, about my girls and how that I love my girls but I want my girls to love me. I want my girls to love me even more than what they love me now. And I thought, you know, I want them to do things and to be ways because they love their daddy. I said, that's the same way with me and God. You know, I love him, but it's because he loved me. That's what the Bible says so that people can get upset about it if they want to. But I love him because he loves me. That's ultimately why I have a love for the God of glory. Because he loves me and he showed me that love. He demonstrated that love. He commended that love. And not just on the cross at Calvary and dying for me. Yes, he done that. Yes, he saved me. Yes, he got me out of a, 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 a miry pit, a horrible, and the miry pit, a horrible pit, placed my feet upon a rock and established my goal and put a song in my heart. Hallelujah. And he done all that, but he loves me still. And throughout the day, I know he loves me. This morning, I got up and got set down at the dining room table with a cup of coffee in my hand had my Bible out and you know what there come the handfuls of purpose and you know what happened the wind blew in my dining room why I knew he loved me as I was reading in the cities of refuge in Joshua I realized praise God he loved me but that was me and I ran to him and he was my refuge he's my rock that's my Jesus hallelujah and just to know that he loves me does something for me just to know that he loves me that's why I'm excited tonight praise God it's because there is someone that loves me and you can get excited too. You may not look like me. Your face might not get red and your veins might not poke out, but praise God, you can be excited because Jesus loves you this evening. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm going to ask Brother Scott Pennell to pray for us. Please, Brother Scott, you pray. Before I come to this evening, in Jesus' name, God, I thank you. The life has been in the house this evening, Lord. God, I pray that not service, Father. God, I pray that you would help us, Lord, to hear your word, Father, and to, and to go through it, Lord God, and to see what you have for us. Lord God, I pray for our church. Lord God, I pray for the spiritual health of our church, Father. God, I pray that we don't uh, back down from where we was, Lord, but we keep moving forward even stronger, Lord. As, yes. Uh, maybe this thing's coming to a close, Father. God, I pray for the next, next upcoming uh, few weeks, Lord, for our state, Lord, and our country, Father. Lord God, that you would help us, Lord, as a, uh, to, to get back out of this uh, thing we've been going through, Father. Lord, I do love you, Lord God. I pray to hear from you this evening. In Jesus' name. Page 553, page 553, come thou fount of every blessing. We're going to sing this song together. Then we may go back and sing another one out of the church hymnal. And some of y'all may know it. If you don't, I know we don't have enough church hymnals out there, but you can get in on the chorus eventually and you'll get with it. We're going to sing the glory land way in just a few moments. Uh, but right now we're going to sing page 553, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing.
I just saw right here. It's page 286, the Glory Land Way. And uh, like I said, if you don't have one of these old hymnals, you probably don't, uh, that'd be fine. We're going to try it anyways and see if we can uh, get on the same page here together and sing it. But uh, you, you pray for us while we try to sing this together. Page 286, the Glory Land Way. Amen. singing. Thank you for singing that with us. Thank y'all for playing. Y'all can be seated. That song on that next page, I like it too, praise God. I'm living in Canaan yes, amen. now. Yes. I'm talking about now. Canaan, in the scripture, some of you know and should know this, is a type of the spirit-filled life, the spirit-filled life, not something that we are still or should not still be trying to live uh, or trying to attain or reach. We should be there now as born-again children of God. Now, there might be some things that we get in our uh, lives that we need to confess, forsake, and get rid of and get back to where we need to be with the Lord. But living in Canaan now should be where Egypt was once my home, the songwriter said. I, I was a slave. Praise God, I'm not a slave anymore. I am, and some would say, yeah, you say you're a bond slave. I am, but I got a master that pays high dividends. Yes. Amen. I'm talking about wonderful dividends. Helpless in sin did roam, love light did crave. But when I looked up to heaven's dome, Christ came to save. Amen. That's what the Lord Jesus Christ done for me and for you, those of us that are saved by God's grace. This evening, if you'll find in your Bible, the book of Exodus in chapter number 27. Exodus in chapter number 27. We will pick back up where we left off last week. And I guess we'll rewind and get these first eight verses of this uh, particular uh, chapter. Last week we started in this chapter, but we didn't read these eight verses because we dealt with the outer court, which we'll probably talk briefly about tonight and mention just a thing or two about it on the way into the message. 
Those of you that are here, I'd like for you to stand with us in reverence to the reading of God's Word. If you're listening by way of internet, I invite you to stand at home. Either way, it's still God's Word and like to reverence it, amen. It means much more than anything else does in our lives. In verse number 1 of Exodus chapter number 27, the Bible says, And thou shalt make an altar of shittim wood, five cubits long and five cubits broad. The altar shall be four square, and the height thereof shall be three cubits. Thou shalt make the horns of it upon the four corners thereof. His horns shall be of the same, and thou shalt overlay it with brass. Thou shalt make his pans to receive his ashes, and his shovels, and his basins, and his flesh hooks, and his fire pans. All the vessels thereof thou shalt make of brass. And thou shalt make for it a great network of brass, and upon the net shalt thou make four brazen rings in the four corners thereof. Thou shalt put it under the compass of the altar, and beneath, that the net may be even to the midst of the altar. And thou shalt make staves for the altar, staves of shittim wood, and overlay them with brass. And the staves shall be put into the rings, and the staff shall be upon the two sides of the altar to bear it. Hollow the boards shalt thou make it. As it was showed thee in the mount, so shall they make it. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come to you this evening. We're so thankful. God, I'm thankful this evening. Lord, I, I don't try not to be thankful at other times, but my heart is swelling this evening with thankfulness. What a blessing it is, God, to be back in the Word of God. Now I pray you would use the Word of God this evening and speak to the hearts of the people of God. Those that are listening by way of Internet, I pray, God, please help them. Touch them. Speak to them. Those that have a certain need, I pray, God, you'd meet their needs. To those that are hurting physically, I pray, God, you'd touch their bodies this evening. Please meet their needs, O oh God. To those that are hurting emotionally, I pray you would touch them. Those that are hurting, Lord, financially, spiritually, whatever it may be, I pray, God, you'd meet their needs. You're a need-meeting God, and I thank you for that. I know that you'll supply all my needs according to your riches and glory in my Christ Jesus. I thank you for that. And I pray, Father, this evening that you'd forgive me of my sin. Lord, I ask you, please, cleanse me, wash me, make me white as snow. Now, I pray this evening, Lord, you'd anoint my lips. I pray, God, you'd unctionize me, fill me with the Holy Ghost of God. Let me preach in your power and your presence. We'll give you the honor and the glory for all that you do. For it is in the Lord Jesus Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Thank you for standing. This evening we'll begin looking here in the text and looking at the study of the tabernacle as we have been. It's been a wonderful study thus far going through the tabernacle. I've enjoyed looking at everything that we've looked at. Uh, I have mentioned that we have worked kind of backwards. We've went from the holiest of holies. We went to the holy place. We've come to the outer court. And now we're getting ready to enter into the outer court or the court of the tabernacle. And we're going to look this evening at how things are when you get through that area. I uh, will go back and we'll just say this concerning the outer court. And concerning how it is uh, showing and the fact that it shows salvation is available to all. I mentioned this last week and the fact that there was a singleness to this court. And as far as the gate goes, there's one way into the court. Only one way into the court. You must go through that gate to get inside the court. I mentioned that the fact is that the gate was not small. It was large enough that anybody and everybody that wanted to go through could go through. 30 feet wide, you can get through it. Seven and a half feet tall, you can get through it. There's no problem for somebody coming in through the gate. There's no problem. And then we think about it as well as this. That gate and the singleness and the spiritual aspect of it, it is available to all. Yes. It was available to everyone that was in Israel. It was available to everyone that was a, 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 a chosen of God as far as the Israel's people. And can I say this? Even strangers in the land, if they chose to be as Israel was, it was available unto them. Now the fact is, if, even though that it was available and even though it was inclusive, it was exclusive as well because it was only going to be there for the one that would walk through the door and if they did not go through the gate, it didn't matter what was on the inside for that individual. They must go through the gate. 
You see, the same thing is with the Lord Jesus Christ. He is available to all, but only to those that call upon his name, only to those that put their faith in Jesus Christ, only to those that will repent of their sin and believe upon him to be their Savior is the ones that will receive him, and that is the only one. Right. Now, it's available. He's available, but not everybody's going to call. Not everybody's going to go through the door. Not everybody's going to walk through that gate. It's like this. I think about how it also shows this. It shows repentance and faith. Yes. I'm talking about the gate literally shows repentance and faith. You say, what do you mean? Well, for one to go through the gate, they must be repenting of the sinfulness of they, who they were, or the sinfulness of the world that they lived in, and repenting of who they are, who they were, and to go through the gate is to put their faith on what's on the other side of the gate and the God of glory that is in the tabernacle. Yes. You see, there was repentance and faith even for Israel. But in today's day, we live in a day where repentance is not preached because repentance doesn't matter anymore, it seems like. People turn repentance into a work of faith or into a work, but repentance is not a work. Repentance is something that when your heart is, is when an individual sees that they're a sinner and that they're lost out on their way to hell. They'll repent of who they are. They'll repent of their sin. They'll turn from their wicked nature and wicked way and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, asking Him for forgiveness. There's repentance, my friend. And then faith goes hand in hand with repentance. They're inseparable twins. Now that's Bible. Yes. The, John the Baptist comes and repent ye for the kingdom is at hand. Jesus come preaching the same message. Paul preached the same message. Peter preached the same message. There's not a different message. The message is the same today that you must repent and put your faith in Jesus Christ if you're going to be saved. You see, the fact is, the individual, whether it be a child, whether it be a middle aged or whether it be an older person in Israel, if they walk up to the gate, they can look at that gate all day long. They can stare at the gate all day long. But the gate was going to do them no good if they didn't go through the gate and decide that the way they lived was not good. It was not good enough. Nothing's good enough to get to heaven outside of going by the way of Jesus. So the individual had to go through the gate saying, I no longer want to be who I am and who I was, but I want what's on the other side. And so they walk through, and they go in, which leads us, and I'll say this as well. I mentioned the fact of separation last week, how the court separated what was on the inside from what was on the outside. And I made the statement, and I stand by it, amen, that what's in here should not be the same as what's out there. That we should be different. We should be holy. Because the Bible tells us that we should be holy and live holy as he's holy. That when we think this, and I made this statement, I said, my babies, when they come in here, this should be a haven for them. Yes. This should be a place where they're not bombarded with the things of the world, where they're not bombarded with the things of the devil, where they're not bombarded with the things of the sin that goes on out there. It should be they come in here and it's like, man, there's something different in here. It's not the same as it is out there. It's not the same as it is out in the world. And so the person that walks into the court and can look when they come through the door and think, you know what, there's a separation now between me and what I used to be, between where I am now and where I used to be. And the man on the outside would be sitting out there, the woman on the outside would be standing on the outside thinking, there's something that stands between me and what's over there. There's something that stands between where I am now and where I should be or where I need to be. And can I say what stands between us and that is our unrighteousness. It is our sin. And because he's a righteous God, he's a holy God, and he's not going to dwell with unrighteousness and with sin. It's got to be paid for. It's got to be dealt with. And so for one to go in, it's like saying, I'm done with this life. And when they get in, it's like, praise God, I'm done with that life. But what's in here is what matters and it's what separates me from them. Yes. That's what the court does. That's what the court is doing for the children of Israel. But you see, it represents Jesus. And that's what he's doing for the child of God. That's what he is for the child of God. Now we find this. The first thing we look at tonight when we think about where we're at in the study of the tabernacle is we are literally at the altar of burnt sacrifice, of burnt offerings. The altar of burnt offerings, you say it's not called that here. No, it's not actually called that here. But I believe it is in chapter number 38 and verse number 1. The Bible says this, and he made the altar of burnt offering. So there you go. It's called that there. He made the altar of burnt offering of Shittim wood. Five cubits was the length thereof. Notice this, and five cubits the breadth thereof. 
It was four square and three cubits the height thereof. Understanding that it's the same exact altar as what we're looking at. It's on a different altar. So what, here's what we find. Number one, under the study of the tabernacle tonight, under the altar of burnt offerings, we see this. We see the site of the altar. The site of the altar. Immediately, when you come through the gate, the first thing you see is you find the preeminence of this site is the altar. The first thing when you come through the gate, there's an altar there. Now, we know what an altar's for. We know what an altar's used for. But the fact is, it wasn't, a, it wasn't tucked away over in a corner somewhere. It wasn't a small piece of furniture. As a matter of fact, if we read it correctly, it's about seven and a half feet wide, seven and a half feet long, or however you want to call that. It's a square. It's about four and a half feet tall. It is literally the largest piece of furniture in this outer court and tabernacle. And there's a reason. Because things get dealt with at this altar. You see, when you come through the gate and you look up, Here's this large piece of furniture. And the large piece of furniture has a fire burning on it. There's a fire going. Well, you would know what that's for because you're bringing in something with you. You say, what you're bringing in with you, this matters, is a sacrifice. What you're bringing in with you is something to be laid upon that altar. You're not coming in empty-handed now. Not at this particular moment. Not at this particular place. And notice this. In the preeminence of this site, when we come through the gate, the first thing we see is we see this altar. Now, can I mention this about what has the preeminence in the Christian life? I, I, surely you understand this by now, if you've been saved for any length of time. Jesus has the preeminence. Yeah. Jesus is meant to have the preeminence. Yeah. Nobody else should have that. Only he should have that. And that is why when things happen in our lives, and when things are going on in our lives, when something else has the place of Jesus, it seems like everything's out of proportion. It seems like nothing is going right. My friend, can I say this? When they come through that gate, if they didn't notice and didn't see that first, at the first thing they didn't see was the altar then nothing else was going to be right nothing else was going to go right because until you went to the altar of burnt offerings you were not going to get to the brazen laver and until you got to the brazen laver you were not going to get to the holy place and you wasn't going to get to the holiest of holies obviously the high priest went in there but my point is you're not getting to where God dwells going past the way God has intended for it to be and for us as saved people as Christian people the preeminence of our sight should be focused on one person, Jesus Christ. All too often we get the preeminence on ourselves. All too often we get the preeminence on something else. We'll put something above Jesus. We'll put something in front of Jesus. We'll have something there. And Brother Scott mentioned it the other night that he was telling the truth. We share a love for the same thing. I do love to fish. I enjoy to fish. But my friend, I'll never let fishing have my preeminence. If I do, I'll break my fishing rods and throw them in the garbage can. If they're going to take preeminence over Jesus... I'll get rid of them. I'll give them away. I'll more or less break them because I don't want somebody else to have the same problem if they come that to me. But the fact is, if something else grabs our attention above Jesus, then it's got the preeminence. And every bit of our Christian life is not going to be right. The preeminence and the, and the sight of our preeminence should be focused on the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's, there's some things that we're going to look at as well that goes along with this preeminence and goes along with the sight. If I'm not mistaken... Scripture says, I'll flip over, I believe it is in Colossians. In Colossians in chapter number 1, we find this speaking of the preeminence. Colossians chapter 1, the Bible says in verse number 15, oh praise God, we're going to get 14. In whom we have redemption through his blood. Now look at that. The Bible says we have redemption through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. I said that on Sunday. That's by the Lord Jesus Christ. That's for the Lord Jesus Christ. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the 
did. That in all things he might have the preeminence. That's what the Bible says. Jesus might have the preeminence. But the Bible says in John chapter 1 that all things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. That's Jesus. He's the word. That's what John chapter number 14 or John chapter number 1 verse number 14 says. And the word was made flesh and he dwelt among us. Jesus is the one to have the preeminence. He should be where your eyes are focused. He should be where your spiritual sight is laid upon. It should only be on Jesus and not anything else. You see, all things were created by him and for him. So since all things were created by him, I wonder who this altar was created by. You see, we're talking about the preeminence of the sight here. Back over in Exodus chapter number 27. Notice something in verse number 8, and then we'll move back up, and we'll continue looking through this on the site of the altar. In verse number 8, the Bible says, Hollow the boards shalt thou make it, as it was showed thee in the mount, so shall they make it. Notice the Bible says it was showed thee in the mount. So somehow, some way, Moses, when he was on the mount, God showed him a tabernacle that was in glory, and it was a picture of the one that they were going to put here. And here's the thing about that tabernacle. is someone made of the altar there. Someone had it patterned for an altar that was in glory. And an altar we know is used for one thing, as that's where we're going to next. We find this on the side of the altar. We find the preeminence of the site. Then we see the purpose of the site. What the sinner seen when he come through the gate was the first thing. And the purpose of this was, is he seen the altar. And understand this, that an altar was made for a sacrifice to be laid on. An altar was made for something to die. An altar was made for a substitution to take place. Now, some people should be getting it right about now. Because when they brought in that lamb, when they brought in that sacrifice, when they brought in what was going to be laid on that altar, we're going to find out that it was a substitutionary sacrifice. We're going to find out that it was saying, Lord, there's nothing that I can do uh, my sin is ever before me and there's nothing that I can do to pay for my sin uh, but instead I bring this innocent animal instead I bring this, uh, un, uh, this not guilty animal instead I'll bring and I'll offer a sacrifice and I'll take this animal and I'll offer it upon the altar of burnt offering but for one reason I'm a sinner yes. and it's going to pay for the price that I cannot pay there's the reason, there's the purpose of the sight of this altar. You see, God has a purpose for everything that's in the scripture. He has a purpose for everything that's found here in this outer court. It's not that they would come in and be like, man, that's a great big old piece of furniture there. Look how pretty that brass is. Now, there, there's a purpose for the brass. We know and we've dealt with this as we've come through the scripture. We've dealt with the fact that the brass shows judgment and how the judgment of God is. And we find that in this brass, not only is this shittim wood here overlaid in brass. Now think about this. Once you get to the holy place, brass stops. Once you get beyond the outer court, there's no more brass. Once you get into the holy place, once you get into the holiest of holies, things are overlaid in gold. It's no longer that brass is found there, but it's because your sin has been dealt with in the outer court. And, your, and the judgment that has been passed was passed in the outer court. And so when you get to the holy place and when you start finding gold, you start finding that the Christ of glory is the one. Now we can see this back in the, uh, in the outer court because here's the thing. When the brass is seen there, it is seen being overlaid on wood. We talked about how that wood was a symbol of the Lord and his humanity and how he became flesh and how he dwelt among us and how he was here and how it showed his divine human nature, the wood that is. And then now you see that brass is laid upon it. Now you see that judgment is laid upon the wood. And can I throw this in there now that we're talking about this altar, now that we're talking about the purpose of the altar, and we'll probably labor on this point for a few moments because it's a good one to labor on. What we see in the fact that this wood was here, you understand that the uh, that the sacrifice would be laid upon the altar. The sacrifice would be laid upon the wood. And can I say that this wood or this Shittim wood, this Achaia wood that is assembled here is the symbol of the Lord Jesus Christ's cross and how that one day he would be laid upon the wood and how one day he would be laid upon the cross and how one day he would be crucified and how one day he would pay our sin debt and how one day, now praise God, we're going to continue with this thought in just a moment, but thinking about the wood that is found here is thinking about the cross that is seen and how the cross was going to be a symbol of the judgment of God upon mankind laid upon Jesus. Now that's where we find it. 
We don't find it laid on us. We find it laid on him. Now here comes the sinner in the gate. The sinner gets through the gate. The sinner sees the altar. The sinner knows what the altar is for. Now, it is not a unknown thing that something has to die for sin. You see, that, it's not a new thing. The Lord didn't say, you know, now that we've built a tabernacle, I want to establish a new thing. Because you go all the way back to Genesis chapter number 3, you'll find out that it was not a new thing. You'll find out after Genesis chapter number 3 that when Adam and when Eve thought that they would clothe themselves, they would do it their own way, they would make their own way. And that's how man has decided they'd do it all throughout the ages. We've already mentioned that when we talked about the singleness last week, that man feels like I'll go my own way. Cain said, I'll go my own way. Nimrod said, I'll go my own way. All throughout the scriptures, people are going their own way. But God has a way, and his way is the only way. And we find that when they made their fig leaves and sowed their fig leaves, together. God said this never will do. This will never do. This ain't going to work. What you've done is going to require something to die. What you've done is going to require blood to be shed. What you've done is going to require something to have to give its life that you might keep yours. So he took the animal skins and he clothed them. And it may not say it there but it is implied there. The only way you can have animal skins is if an animal died for them. It's the only way. He's not just going to make animal skins. There's animals already around. Something died that they might continue and that they might have fellowship with God. That the relationship would come back around. That is why Abel brought forth of that. That's why he brought his sacrifice forward and offered that sacrifice. There must have been an altar. He offered a sacrifice. And we think about this. They would come in. They know that the way they're going is God's way. They know they're not going their way because they just come through the gate. They have a sacrifice. They see, the, they see this, this altar of burnt offerings. They know what goes on it. Now we'll think about this as we continue to see the altar. As we, continue, as we think about the sacrifice that is brought in, we think about how this sacrifice would have been made for the individual that was bringing it in because of the individual's sin that is there. And when we think about what is taking place, we can consider this. They weren't just going to bring anything in there. There was specific instructions on what got brought. Yes. There were specific instructions on what couldn't get brought. What wasn't going to be accepted by God? You see, not everything is accepted by God. That's right. Not everything is accepted by God. As much as, as, as much as people may want people to think that this is acceptable in His sight, we know what's acceptable in His sight because we see it in the Word of God. We don't have to go anywhere else. Somebody else don't have to roll it down to me. Somebody else don't have to tell me what's accepted by God because I can read His Word and understand the Word of God, what is accepted and what's not accepted. But we find this when we think about this sacrifice. And we think about how this sacrifice that was consumed by the fire that was on the altar. And we think about how this sacrifice that when it was brought in, it was laid upon the altar. Consider this. There's four horns on this altar. That's what the scripture talks about. We've mentioned in days gone by that these horns was a symbol of power. We talk about, you know, in Revelation talks about there's a little horn that's there. And that horn and what it does and how it does and the power that is found in that horn. But here's what I would say about these horns on this altar. These horns on this altar, I believe it's in Psalm 118. Don't quote me. My mind's a little fuzzy right now. But in Psalm 118, I believe it talks about how it would be bound by the horns on the altar. It was for the sacrifice. wasn't going to go anywhere. It was going to stay right there on the altar. Why? Because there was a purpose for this sacrifice. Now think about it. As they come through, they see the position. They see where it is. They see what's going on. They see what's happening. They take this body. They take this sacrifice. They lay it down. Now I can almost go back and I can almost see in Genesis when Abraham and Isaac go up a mount. Abraham says, Daddy, ultimately, Daddy, I see the fire. I see the wood, Daddy. Where's the lamb? Where's the sacrifice? Even Isaac knew there's no sacrifice, Daddy. Where's the sacrifice? Abraham said God will prepare himself a sacrifice. He's provided a sacrifice. He'll provide it. Since the beginning, God has provided his sacrifice. God hasn't needed man to provide a sacrifice. From the beginning, God in his heart, before we ever came about, had in his 
heart already for the beginning of time, for the foundation of the world, he had the sacrifice already for us. And we think about how they would come in with that sacrifice. They would take that spotless lamb, come in there, and going to offer that upon the altar and lay it there and have it be consumed and have it be burnt up and have it be used. Now, can I say that when the Lord Jesus Christ was brought in, when the Lord Jesus Christ came, when the Lord Jesus Christ was here, when the Lord Jesus Christ showed up on the scene, there wasn't a spot in him. There wasn't a sin, nary a one. Now, that may not be good English, but that's what we're using. There was no sin found in Jesus. There was no sin uh, Anyone can look and say, man, look at that blemish. Man, look at how awful he is. No, he was perfect, friend. And here's the thing. For a sinner that is me, uh, that met a Savior, that is him, and that found the substitutionary sacrifice in the Lord Jesus Christ, it was a one and done thing, friend. And this evening, if you're saved by God's grace, you can stand upon that he was your substitute, that he paid your sin debt. And my friend, if you're here this evening, or if you're listening this evening and you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ, you've never repented of yourself and who you are and of your sin, you've never laid it down before the Lord on an altar. I'm not saying you've got to literally get on an altar like this, but there'll be an altar in your heart that you'll lay upon and you'll ask him to forgive you and you'll put your faith in him to be your savior and your sacrifice and he'll pay the sin debt. He's paid the sin debt. You just got to accept the fact that it's been paid for you. Yes, we think about the four horns. We think about how that for the four horns they were sprinkled with blood of the sacrifice. You find it in Exodus chapter number 29 and verse number 12. That's what the Bible says. And thou shalt take of the blood of the bullock and put it upon the horns of the altar with thy finger and pour all the blood beside the bottom of the altar. You see this, this blood it mattered. This blood was placed upon all four horns. You find these four blood-stained horns pointing to the four quarters of the earth spoke of in the, how salvation is for all. We find the four corners of the earth. We think about that in the scripture, what the Bible says. We find that they were there to use to bind the sacrifice. I mentioned that a moment ago. Can I say this? There was something that bound the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. There were nails that were driven through him. There were nails that were driven through his hands, through his feet. His side was riven. Why? For you, for me, for us, that we might be saved. That is what we find there. But notice this as well. We'll continue on because we see some other things that is found in, with this altar and at this altar on the fact that how it was for me and for you all this took place. In verse number 3, the Bible says, And thou shalt make his pans, we find the pans that are in the site, to receive his ashes and his shovels and his basins and his flesh hooks and his fire pans, all the vessels thereof sh thou shalt make of brass. We still find that everything is made of brass. We find that everything that is there it is still the utensils that are used to serve the altar were all types of Christ. The pans were used for the ashes. The ashes of the sacrifice were literally there in the pans. Now, I'll say this. There was a net that was formed on the bottom side that was in brass that the fire would burn up through. And the reason it wasn't used of any other precious metal is because no other metals could con would be able to contain and handle the fire that was going to be burning for the sacrifice to still be there. A.K.A. they used brass. Amen. There's a reason why God had everything planned out uh, the way he, that he did. The shovels were used for picking up the ashes and tending the fire. You know what happened with those ashes? They would take those ashes and put them on the east side of the altar and then after that they would take those ashes and they would take them outside the camp and they would pour out the ashes on the outside of the camp. Uh, can I say this about the sacrifice? That every bit of the sacrifice was consumed. Every bit of the sacrifice was either burnt up uh, or the meat was taken and it was being used and it was being eaten by the priest and used in that manner but the fact is that all of the sacrifice was used. None of it was wasted. Uh, my friend, there's never been a drop of blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that's ever been wasted. I don't care what none of them say. I don't care how they feel concerning the blood of Jesus. None of it's been wasted. It's placed upon a mercy seat, upon an altar in glory. And it's all there. And can I say that the blood of Jesus was shed for you and for me. And it was not wasted to be done that way. And now I want you to understand that the blood of Christ is still there. And we think about the blood that 
was used here of this offering or this sacrifice. We think about how the ashes that were used here and the ashes that were taken out and the ashes, how they symbolized that the sin and that the, it was taken and placed on the outside. Now think about this, how they look to the Lord Jesus Christ. The ashes were a testimony of complete acceptance of the sacrifice. And here it is. There's no more a sacrifice on the altar. It's all gone now. All that is left is ashes. And the fact is that the God of glory, that he and that his wrath has been appeased, that his wrath has been put, uh, put away because of the sacrifice that is there upon the altar, that is no longer found there because ashes is all that's left and it's acceptable in his sight. That is the same way with the Lord Jesus Christ when he was upon the cross and the Lord Jesus Christ was dying for us and the judgment was laid upon him. Our sin was laid upon him. Our iniquities that he took, our judgment was placed upon him by the Father. And you know what it done? It pleased the Father to bruise him. Why? For our sakes that we might be redeemed and we find that in the scripture when we concern his ashes how it was accepted, the sacrifice was then we see that as a type of the Lord you'll note that the sacrifice was consumed. The ashes lay there on the side. They were removed, taken to the outside of the camp uh, to clean or a clean place and poured out before God. That's what they done with the ashes. And so our Lord was completely consumed as it were on the cross of Calvary where he hung for some period of time after his death. He was then removed and placed in a new tomb that was located outside the city. We noticed that it would have been a place that would have been clean. It would have been a place that had never been used. It would have been a place that nobody had ever laid before. That's where they lay him. And my friend, can I say this? That is not where he stayed. But praise God, he rose again and is coming again, the Bible tells us. And so we find that how it shows the fact that the Lord Jesus is pictured here in this altar with a sacrifice. He is a picture of the altar himself. The Lord is. When we think about how that altar is holding that sacrifice that should have been the individual. Now that sacrifice died in the individual's place. Now think about this. He died in our place. He is the one that holds us. We don't hold him. It's not us doing something for him. He done it for us. Half the time when we get ready to do something, either we want somebody else to see us do it or either we want to, do, uh, we want to feel like we're doing God a favor. That's not the case. That's not the case at all, what we do for the Lord Jesus Christ. We find that the reason we do is because we love him. I'll serve him. I said it earlier, and I heard it in a song just here recently, because I love him. That's why I serve him. We find the fire that is on the altar. The Bible talks about the fire that is there and how it burns up. It burned continually, the Bible says. In Leviticus chapter number 16, Leviticus chapter number 16, or chapter number 6, I'm sorry. In verse number 12 and 13, this is what the Bible says. The fire upon the altar shall be burning in it, shall not be put out. And the priest shall burn wood on it every morning. And lay the burnt offering in order upon it. And he shall burn thereon the fat of the peace offerings. Their fire shall ever be burning upon the altar. It shall never go out. It shall never go out. The fire showed the holiness of God and the justice of God. It is what consumed the sacrifice. God's holiness, I mentioned earlier, God's holiness. Thinking about that one that's getting ready to come in the court. They understand what's in there is not what's out there. That's not who they are. Since they're coming in, they're accepting that the fact that what's on the inside is holy. What they're bringing in, what they're going to have to use for a substitute. Why? Why does there have to be a substitute? Why does there have to be anything? Why can't it just be everything's okay? Because he's a holy God. Everything is, for a, a person that has never been saved, everything's not okay. They may walk around like life is just the norm, like everything's fine, but if you've never been saved, everything's not okay because he's a holy God. Right. And we're unholy people. He's a just God. Yes. And his justice 
must be appeased. And that's what the fire would do. It was a symbol of how God's readiness to receive the sacrificial offering for people to cleanse them from their sin. We find that as well in Leviticus in chapter number 9. This is what the Bible says. Leviticus chapter 9, verse number 24. And there came a fire from before the Lord and consumed upon the altar the burnt offering and the fat, which when the people saw, they shouted and fell on their faces. You see, that fire was ever ready for when the sacrifice came. It was there to consume it. And we think about in 1 Kings in chapter number 18, verse number 38. You can look there. You'll find it there as well. Romans chapter 12. We're getting ready to be done. But in Romans chapter number 12, verses number 1 and 2, the Apostle Paul pins down for us under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. In Romans chapter 12, I can quote this, but I'm going to read it verbatim because I don't want to miss anything. Verses number 1 and 2. Verse number 1, it says this, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. Notice, he's beseeching the brethren by the mercies of God. Now, here's where we're going to bring it down to an end, and we're going to get ready to close in just a moment. I'll say this concerning this altar that we're looking at, a burnt offering. There's an altar today for every born-again child of God that's not living the way he should or she should live. Romans chapter number 12, he is beseeching the Romans. He says, I'm begging you. I'm pleading with you. I'm praying that you'll do this. Notice what the thing is that he says. That you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now hold on a minute. Where does the sacrifice go? It goes on the altar. That's where the sacrifice goes. What's the altar? What's going on on the altar? There's a fire there at the altar. It's consuming what's laid upon it. Now, can I say this? And it's not that we're going to start a fire in a grill or start a fire somewhere and hop over in it and say, okay, here's my body. And just go ahead and let it be burnt up. But the fact is this, that he says that you present your body as a living sacrifice, not a dead sacrifice. Then take that sacrifice and lay it on there. It's dead now. It's being burnt now. But he said your body, it's a living sacrifice. He don't want something that's dead. That's not what the Lord Jesus Christ is after. He died so you might have life. That's what the Bible says. So what he's desiring, what he wants, what he's asking of us is that we lay it all upon the altar. And that we say, Lord, you can have every last bit of me. Lord, if it's a parent, Lord, you can have my kids. Lord, you can have my job. Lord, you can have my life. Lord, whatever it is, you can have it all. I lay it upon an altar of sacrifice for you and this altar of burnt offerings for this reason. Because once you lay it down, it gets consumed. It belongs to God now. It is acceptable to him. You say, why do you say that? Romans chapter 12 verse 1 says, and then a living sacrifice holy, acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service is what the Bible says. It is acceptable in his sight when you lay everything, all of your will, all of your being upon an altar of sacrifice to the Lord not holding anything back but laying everything down saying it's yours God. Take me. Use me. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. That's what I desire. That's what I want. That's what we need in 2020. That's what we need in April. That's what we need on the 22nd day. That's what we need tonight is we need somebody that'll say, God, take me. Use me how you want me. I want to lay my life on this altar. I want you to have me. I want to be burning hot for you. I want to be consumed by you. And you're the only now. The Bible says that my God is a consuming fire. That's what the scripture says. I know what it means there. But the same thing we could apply to our lives. That if we would let him consume us, we would no longer be seen. If something consumes something that's like this, Brother Scott, you go down to the hamburger joint and you get a hamburger and consume it. No longer do they see the hamburger, but now they see you. Why? Because you partook of the hamburger. It's gone. All that they see now is you. Here's the thing. When you lay your all on the altar for the Lord Jesus Christ, the songwriter said, is your all on the altar of sacrifice made? Is your all on the altar? When you lay it all down on the altar and it's no longer seen, you're no longer seen, what comes up from that altar is pleasing to the Lord. It's acceptable in His sight. And it is Him that everybody else will see. 
They'll no longer see Seth Bunch. They'll no longer see Laura Beth. They'll no longer see young David Walker. What they'll see then is they'll see something that's been accepted by God. They'll see something that is running for the Lord. They'll see something that is going for God. You say, why? The Bible says in verse number 2, Romans chapter 12, as he is beseeching them, he goes on to say, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's all about God. That's what it's all about. That's what it was about in Exodus chapter 27, verses 1 through 8. That's why the altar of burnt offering was there, because when they come through that sacrifice, when they made their way through, when they come through the gate, they knew everything on the inside of that gate is about God. Everything when I walk through the gate is going to be about God. And maybe somebody comes out and they say, oh my, what's on the inside in there is far beyond compare. When you get in there, there's nothing like it. And somebody goes in thinking, you know what, I need to go in there. I got my sacrifice and I'm going. They go through, they lay their sacrifice down on the altar. Now they get a little dirty, they get a little bloody, things happen. And they think, you know what, there's a labor on the other side. There's something on the other side over here. I'm going wash in and can I say praise God we're not at the labor yet but we will be next week and there's one that we can be cleansed by there's one that we can wash in this evening his name's Jesus as well we find in the scripture be not conformed to this world but be transformed how are we to be transformed church here's how we're to be transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God you see there's a Bible that I hold in my hand and you know if you read this Bible then it'll change who you are if you read this Bible it'll alter the inside it'll take what's on the inside and make it clean like the Bible talks about you see it don't just clean the outside it cleans the inside now can I say this when the inside gets clean. The outside can't help but get that way. What's on the outside will start manifesting what's on the inside. And it'll start looking like what's on the inside. I'm not saying everybody's going to look the exact same, but I am saying this. The fact is that the Lord Jesus Christ wants us to be like He is. Desires for us to be like the Lord. We think about that altar. We think about the blood that's on that altar. That blood, you know what that blood was 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 there for, correct? Surely you know what that blood's there for. I mean, life has just died. Blood has just been shed. We know the Bible says that the life is in the blood. Blood is shed, so life is taken. When life is taken, life is given. Eternal life was given when the Lord Jesus Christ gave his life on the cross at Calvary. That's why we have it. There is no other way. That's why we have eternal life. Through the shed blood, of the crucified Son of God. But then we find that the, the atonement is applied to a person, their sin is covered, the sinner is purged or cleansed of their sin, the wrath of God is appeased. In the Old Testament, these things were only temporary. The fact is that every year, every year, every year, my pastor would say that it was just a renewal of the note. It's like they had a bank note and they had to go down and renew it every year. Yeah. I mean, some of us can understand that. I've refinanced my house. I know what it's like to have to refi. I know what it's like to refinance. Some of you know what it's like to refinance. All you're doing is putting it off a little longer. Putting it off a little longer. Sometimes, you know, you have to renew a note. You're putting it off even longer. That's what was taking place. This here sacrifice is a substitute for me. Until the next time, I have to bring this sacrifice again. My pastor would say, but when Jesus came, no more. There was no more putting it off anymore. There was no more renewing the note anymore. What we find when Jesus came, what we find when he paid the sacrifice, what we find when he laid his life on the altar is we find that the note was paid in full, that the note was paid off, and that the note was no longer outstanding, but it was paid for by the blood of the crucified one, by Jesus Christ, paid our sin debt. We find salvation seen here. I said earlier, 
that the, when Christ was offered upon Calvary's cross, he represented a death that ended in life. Think about that for a moment because the sacrifice, it represented a death. The, the, it was just a death that went there and it just spared for another year. And that this death was over and then another death happened. But the Lord Jesus Christ, this is not the case with him because his death, well, it ended in life because he came up out of a tomb. He's no longer there, but it didn't just end with life for him. It ended with life for all who would put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He resurrected from the grave. The fact that Christ died and lived means that the result of his sacrifice is eternal. That's what Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 23 through 27 says. I'm going to flip over there and we'll read that text and we'll be done this evening. In Hebrews in chapter number 7, the Bible says this in verse 23 and through 27. It says, and they truly were many priests and because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore he is able also to save them unto the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. For such an high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice first for their own sins, or for his own sins, and then for the peoples. For this he did once when he offered himself, offered up himself. Now think about this. Every priest in there had to make a sacrifice for their own sin because they was but mere man. The priest, when he offered a sacrifice for someone else, had already offered a sacrifice for his own sin. But my friend, this priest, my high priest, he never offered a sacrifice for himself because he never knew sin. There was no sin in him. He was unlike anyone else that had ever been there and done what he was doing. He offered up a sacrifice and the sacrifice that he offered up was himself and it was an eternal sacrifice for us all that put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, he never offers another one. It's already been made. It was made in the sinless Son of God. It is the God of glory that declares the sinner to be righteous and he declares that the sinner is righteous through his son. No other way. We keep going back to the fact that there's a singleness there, but the fact is that there's a singleness there. Nothing else is accepted. Nothing else is worthy. Nothing else can pay that. There's no amount of money that can pay that debt. There's no, there's no amount of anything that can pay that debt. A, because the debt's paid already. But B, because nothing else is going to appease God. Nothing else is going to be accepted by God. Because God has chosen through his son to declare a sinner righteous because of what Jesus Christ is. All of us that are saved would have to admit that many times in practice, that many times in practice of our own daily lives, that we might not be all that righteous. But the fact is, he is righteous. Yes. And it's his righteousness that we are robed in, right. not we ourselves. The individual that comes to the outer court, now I'll say this, for everybody that may be listening, for everybody that may be in here, you might be in here, you might go to God's house one day whenever you come back to the church house. But just because you come to a place that's a church or just because you listen to a live stream, just because you hear somebody else does not mean that you are. The fact is that just because the other man went through the gate don't mean it's good enough for me. I must go through the gate. Christ said, and if I be lifted up. Now we think about that brass being a symbol of judgment, that brazen serpent that was lifted up. And the reason it was lifted up was because judgment, fiery judgment had fell already. You know, those other serpents. They looked to that serpent. You know what that is? That's repentance and faith. They, re 
to look at the serpent was repenting of who they were and what they had done and the reason why the judgment was there. And to look at that serpent was faith in the fact that if I look at that serpent, I'll be fine. I'll be healed. Christ Jesus, you see, he has found, and no matter what you find in here, you're going to find Jesus. Yes. You're going to find Christ. The altar of burnt offering, the Lord Jesus Christ is seen in the altar of burnt offering. The fact is, the reason the altar is there is for that sacrifice to be laid on it. That'd be a good question tonight. Is your all on the altar? Is your all. I'm talking about the saved people right there. But here it is to a sinner. Have you accepted the sacrifice that was made for you? You say, well, I've seen other people that say they've, they've accepted the sacrifice and it don't, it don't look like it amounted to much. You better be careful. You better be careful. Because you're comparing yourself to someone else. And you see, the fact is, you're not going to be judged to how somebody else is. You're not going to be judged when you stand before the God of glory on whether or not you are better than someone else. It's going to be the fact, what did you do with my son? What did you do with the sacrifice that was made? What did you do with Jesus? Well, that person didn't really live the way that I thought they should live. You better let God handle that. You better look the way you're living and who you are and look to who Jesus is. The preeminence of the altar. The preeminence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, thank you so much for the scripture. Thank you so much for the evening. Thank you so much for the altar of sacrifice, the altar of burnt offering. When I think about the differences between these two altars that we've looked at so far, we have the altar of burnt offerings. Then we have the altar of incense. We have this altar on the outside that is offering up a sacrifice. But we have the altar that's on the inside that is offering up prayers. Thank you, God, for how we see Christ Jesus in both. Lord, I pray for every soul listening. I don't know. I don't know the hearts of every soul that's in here tonight. But Lord, I ask you if there's a lost person in here that they would chunk whatever it is that they're trying to hold on to. There's a lost person listening to me by way of internet. They'd chunk whatever it is they're trying to hold on to. And understand that Christ Jesus has paid their sin debt. And I pray God, I've asked you this many times, I'm asking you again. I'm asking you, God, please, do a work in our hearts. Do a work in our hearts that's eternal. A work in our hearts that people will see today that something is going on with us. Don't let us be content with the things of this world. Shake us up, O oh Lord. Stir our hearts. Help us to lay every bit of ourselves down for you. I beseech you, O oh God. Work in our hearts. Stir us up. Set our hearts on fire. Never let us take for granted what we have in salvation. Let us be ever thankful. But Lord, let us be about thy business. I'm asking you to set my heart on fire, O oh God. Stir me, Lord. Let me shake my let me shake my apathy. Oh, God, forgive me. Woe is me. Forgive me, oh, Lord. Thank you so much for your word. I love you, and I thank you, and I praise you, the Lord Jesus Christ, and we do pray. Amen. I would ask all of you to continue praying, continue praying for your church family, continue praying for other churches as well as they seek to do what the Lord would have them to do and how the Lord wants them to do. 
Every local assembly is not the same. I know that. The demographics of different churches are different. I know that. We're seeking the Lord on how to do and how to move forward and um, what to do. I ask you please to pray for our, our leaders, that God would work in them, God would help them and touch them. Um, those of you that are listening by way of live stream, there will be a video done on Friday uh, I'd ask you if you are listening by live stream to view on Friday again. Um, I'll send a one call out letting you know what time the video will be sent or be done. That way you can get on and watch it live if you would like to. If not, you can view it either way. It'll be on there. Concerning the church, concerning services and how things will go. Um, we will continue. We have. We were doing live stream services anyway. We'll continue to be doing live stream services all along. And I, I'm thankful for those that uh, put time in to do that, um, and and have devoted themselves to try their best um, to to keep up with uh, your pastor as he moves around because it's hard to stay still. Uh, but also that those at home can see. That's a blessing. I know we have some that can't go, that, that just are at home, and then some that are not even around here that view um, several states away or even countries away as far as that goes. Um, so I'm thankful for you that, that listen that way. Continue to do so. I continue to ask the Lord to bless and to touch and to help you. Um, but it's wonderful uh, to be able to, to open the Word of God again. I love all of you. Uh, God bless you, and have a good night. Amen.